you know, coming to Jap- to Yamaguchi Prefecture in 2004 uh, was a really, really good time to come because, of course, that's when that sort of uh, the Yamaguchi you know, spark was was really starting to, to blaze up into flames and, you know, Dasai was coming out with, with all of its its major stuff. And then, of course, uh, Toyobi Jean and, and all the, these really great brands were just really getting into their stride. So I was lucky enough to kind of be there for that. Ride. We're, we're both complete geeks. We, <laughs> we both, we both read, collect, you know, study, you know, very old, sometimes very hard to find brewing textbooks or, or just books about sake brewing. And it just felt that it, it, it was a good opportunity for, you know, me and Jim to combine our collective knowledge and put it out there into, into the world. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 35 of Sugidama podcast. The podcast about Japanese sake, the drink that is rooted deep in traditions, but so multifarious that it's difficult to keep up with all its trends and developments. So today we are going to talk to Jim Ryan and Andrew Russell from the Great Sake Deep Dive podcast about what is going on in the sake world. But before I play our conversation, let me tell you about our sponsor, London Sake, which has one of the widest selections of premium and craft sake available online today. You can choose from over 100 sake from 25 breweries and they will deliver across the UK and many European markets. And if you don't know what sake to choose, you can use simple online tasting notes together with very sensible and affordable food pairings to help you decide. What's more, you can get a 10% discount by just using the code SUGIDAMA all caps during checkout. London Sake, making sake simple. My name is Alex and I live in London. I am a certified sake specialist, sake judge, sake educator and sake advocate. Besides this podcast, I have Sugidama blog where I write about all things sake and publish tasting notes, overviews and information about sake events happening in London. You surely remember Andrew Russell from episode 19, where we were talking about sake yeast. He's a sake brewer working at the Imada Shuzo in Hiroshima. Jim Ryan lives in Yamaguchi Prefecture and is a freelance translator, writer and publisher of the Ochoko Times newsletter. Oh, Jim's new book about Yamaguchi sake is out in February 2023. I will put a link to the pre-order page in the show notes if you are interested. Andrew and Jim also produce and host the Sake Deep Dive podcast, which takes a very detailed look at various sake subjects. If you remember, I mentioned Sake Deep Dive in the first episode of this season and referred to it a couple of times in subsequent episodes. It's a great podcast if your interest in sake is beyond casual drinking and just enjoying it. So let's listen to my conversation with Jim and Andrew. Please welcome our guest. Hello, Jim. Hello, Andy. I'm very happy to see you. Thanks a lot for coming to the podcast. Thanks a lot for accepting my invitation. How are you? Uh, I'm great. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for for having us. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a pleasure our my first podcast guest appearance. <laughs> yeah, good good to see you again Alex and and thank you for having me on a second time. So much appreciated. Yeah, you the first second timer on my podcast. <laughs> oh wow, I'm I'm very privileged. <laughs> Thanks a lot. 
Um, so probably we start uh, with uh, your background. Andrew told us about his background, so probably Andrew can talk a bit of what he's up to now. And for Jim, if you don't mind to tell us about your background, how you get into sake, these kind of things. Andy, why don't you start? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep my introduction brief because, uh, like Alex said, I've I've been on before. So uh, my name's Andrew Russell. Um, I, I'm from uh, originally from Edinburgh uh, in Scotland. Uh, I now live um, between Hiroshima and uh, Akko in Hyogo Prefecture in Japan. Uh, I'm a sake brewer. Uh, I'm obviously fortunate to be Jim's uh, co-host on Sake Deep Dive. Uh, and I'm also the, the creator of the Origin Saki website and blog. Great. Um, so I'm Jim Ryan. Uh, I am originally from Kansas in the United States. Kansas is not a particularly famous place. So, you know, everybody's out there probably looking it up on Google. There's nothing there. I can tell you that much. Uh, I've been in Japan for uh, coming up on 18 years now. Uh, I, I moved here in 2004, in June of 2004, so I'm very close to my japan anniversary. <laughs> and uh, the whole time I've lived in Yamaguchi Prefecture, which is at the sort of the western tip of the main island of Honshu. It is the western tip. Like, it's it, it, it's the uh, the only prefecture here out at the very end. And um, so, like, how I got into sake is um, not a particularly unusual story. I had had sake in the United States and of course I, it was not very good. It was uh, probably low quality, poorly kept, poorly served. Uh, I didn't enjoy it. But then of course I came to Japan and uh, some people, you know, kind of showed me what was up. Um, and, you know, coming to, Jap to Yamaguchi Prefecture in 2004 uh, was a really, really good time to come because of course that's when that sort of uh, the Yamaguchi you know, spark was was really certain to, to blaze up into flames, and you know Dasai was coming out with with all of its its major stuff, and then of course uh, Toyobi Jean and, and all the these really great brands were just really getting into their stride. So I was lucky enough to kind of be there for that ride, and then in two thousand eight, I guess it was, I had my first sake brewery tour. And it was Yamagata Honten in Shunan City, Yamaguchi Prefecture, and it was, uh, and that that was when I first really got a glimpse inside the 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 whole process, and that that sparked off a whole other uh, a, a whole other adventure. Hmm. And you know, since since then, you know, I, I I I've been learning, and and of course, a big part of that is just sort of Japanese, like learning the Japanese language and getting able to to communicate with the, the people in the community and um since i guess 2016 i've been a tra freelance translator and writer and i've been uh trying to focus a lot on the local sake community and the local sake industry in my work so i translate uh, brewery websites and i write uh, articles introducing local breweries and sort of lots of stuff like that so yeah i guess Professionally, I've been involved in, in sake since uh, 2018, I guess is when that, that started. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because, um, yeah, you probably one of the few uh, writers about sake who is based not in Tokyo but um, or not in Kyoto, but in much more remote place, which with much more interesting local sake scene which is uh, really fascinating. Yeah, it's it, it's just a completely different world from, I think, Tokyo and, and, and the, what people think of when they, they think of Japan. Uh, so, yeah, I, I feel lucky to, to be out here, actually. Yeah, and I, I think we are also lucky because we can get some insight, some glimpse of um, local sake culture rather than talking about like, um, you know, what is going on in the big sake uh, areas and the big cities, which is always fascinating. So you, you've got now podcast, Sake Deep Dive. How did you come up with this idea? And how did you decide 
that you want to do it together um, rather than doing individually. Because I know that Andy is uh, very busy during brewing season um, making sake. And uh, judging by, by your Twitter, you, you're also very busy with, you've got your own newsletter, you've got a lot of work in your like probably main job as a freelance translator and writer. So how did you come up with this idea of podcast? How you come up with the idea of doing it together and how does it work? Well, it was, it was Andrew's idea. So Andy, Andy can probably speak to it better than I could. Yeah, I think me and Jim uh, had, had been friends for, uh, for over a year by the, by the time that we came up with the idea for starting a podcast and I, I'd always felt, and it, it, you know, it's, it's no disrespect to any of the other podcasts. It's not saying about, you know, one being better than the other, but the, I felt there was a gap in the, I guess, in the market or, you know, there, there was a lacking of a podcast that, that really catered for the beyond beginner. You know, the, the people specifically that are maybe actually brewing sake or um, that, that really want to, to take their learning to, to the next level. And I knew, you know, from numerous conversations with Jim that, that we were both kind of on the same, you know, level in terms of, you know, we're, we're both complete geeks. We, <laughs> we both, we both read, collect, um, you know, study, you know, very old, sometimes very hard to find um, brewing textbooks or, or just books about sake brewing. And it just felt that it, it, it was a good opportunity for, you know, me and Jim to, you know, um, c- combine our collective knowledge and put it out there into the, into the world. Um, and I think, you know, f- for, for me, Jim, Jim was, uh, was the perfect um, partner for, you know, for starting that podcast because, um, you know, we, Jim's Japanese is, uh, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I can read, um, you know, Japanese if I put my mind to it, it takes me a bit longer. So, you know, we both have that ability where we can, we can actually, you know, you know, make sense of these old textbooks and, you know, put them out there in, uh, into, you know, uh, understandable manner. Hopefully that's, that's how the podcast comes off. So, so yeah, that was, that was really it. We, we just talked one night about, um, you know, doing something new and, um, you know, we both, you know, write blogs, we both have our own website and things. And I think, you know, starting a podcast was just the, the logical next step. So, you know, for, from there, it was just really discussing what sort of format we wanted to do. Obviously, ours differs from a lot of other podcasts in that it it's quite, goes on quite long. I think maybe some of our episodes have lasted over an hour. So there was, there was concerns about the, the length of it and obviously the frequency of it as well. But I think... Really, there's no way of getting around that. Our our podcast is um, it's going to remain monthly, I would guess, and it's going to have to stay at that kind of length. And we we really only cater to you know advanced topics. And um, so, if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in, you know, really going going beyond the surface, and um, then give our podcast a listen. Yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot to add to that. I um, you, from the very beginning, you know, like you mentioned, Alex, you, obviously during the, the 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 brewing season, Andy is extremely busy. So you know, I kind of worry about you know keeping up the schedule, but it, it's worked out okay, and it's actually it's been a nice kind of I don't know change of pace. We we don't meet, we don't get a chance to meet that often, and so you know these these semi regular conversations that we get to have are. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a lot of fun. And um, I think as we have progressed through the season, I don't know if we, I don't think we're going to do seasons, actually. I think just as, as we've kept going, I think we were kind of getting a handle on the, the kind of pace and the, 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 the structure that, that allows these more in-depth and more maybe complex topics to, to become digestible. Hmm. Yeah, but yeah, we're we're still we're I think we're still getting started, uh, so you know, I look forward to seeing how it goes in the future. Yeah, I think you definitely pick up the very good 
niche because to be honest there are not that many uh, sake podcasts around around and uh, there is a sake on air obviously the first one but while they doing the podcast mostly for the uh, professionals it's more like for people who for educate who um, is involved in distribution these kind of things uh, although they talk about very deep topics sometimes but it's still not uh, in technical and there are two podcasts like Sugidama and Sake Revolution and we're trying to talk to people who just started drinking sake or haven't drunk sake before and want to know more about it and obviously your podcast it came as a very very deep look at particular topics which really enjoyable and i can see that you do a lot of research before recording each topic so it's it quite understandable it takes some time to produce each episode so um i'm very was very excited when the first episode came out i was thinking oh yeah it's exactly what i need because i need some kind of meat beyond all this kind of obvious stuff which you can pick up from books and um, textbooks in English because you've got access to Japanese sources and you are based in Japan. So it makes it an uh, amazing podcast. Thank you for saying that. Thank you very much. Well, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, the access thing is really big and I, I think in general, the English language sake, uh, I don't want to say market, just the English language sake world, it's still at the level of popularization. Like there's still just not that many people who know what it is and how it is. And obviously there's still a need for a lot of that introductory stuff. There's, there's always going to be this constant wave of people getting introduced to, to the topic and and wanting to to start with the basics. And that's obviously vital but without anything to go beyond that like once you've consumed all of that that introductory knowledge there's definitely i think a space for the more technical the more in-depth the, the the more geeky stuff and and i i think that we're there's a lot there that, that we can still explore so hopefully people will stay interested yeah yeah i think so i think so i think people who want to go beyond just general stuff they will definitely uh will keep listening to your podcast yeah um i'm sure um so the topic of this um, conversation is the current sake trends but before that can we just briefly talk about the big move from let's say uh kimota which was dominant probably brewing method during two, three hundred years, uh, probably even more, to Sokoji Mota, uh, which became dominant <laughs> brewing method now. So uh, more, more about what was it, the main drivers in general in uh, sake innovation? Is it the some technological things that appear and breweries pick up them and use for sake brewing? Or it's uh, the drive to reduce cost and try to uh, improve their profits or it's uh, to make sake better and um, uh, try to keep up with a changing uh, taste what, what do you think obviously there is no <laughs> definite answer but i'm just wondering if we can just like speculate <laughs> if you like do, do you want me to get the ball rolling on that jim or uh sure uh, go for it, and uh, <laughs> uh, let me uh, let me pop some popcorn. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Well, f f first and foremost, you're right. There isn't a kind of quick, simple answer. It you know, it, it, it's this, but it, really, what you're looking at is brewers trying to find stability. That that that's it. You know, in a, in a modern sense, people talk about kimoto and they talk about you know flavor profiles or Typically, they talk about acidity and things like that. These were not the driving forces behind the development of, you know, Kimoto, Yamaha to, to Sokujo. It's all about, you know, stability. 
during the the Edo period and obviously before the Edo period as well, that that was a, a huge problem for for sake brewers was the the spoilage rate, and and this was a big deal. I mean, it's quite gruesome some of the stuff that you hear about the pressure that was on these brewers and what would happen, you know, for you know if they did, if their sake spoiled. This was a, a very serious issue for for sake brewers. So that's where the driving force comes, and as their 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 understanding you know during really what we're talking about is the the Edo period to the Meiji period the the transformation that goes on during that period is nothing short of phenomenal you know how they've gone from you know bodai moto in you know the muromachi period where which is a period of you know great you know upheaval in Japan you know the civil war you know plaguing the country for you know for decades and then you come into the Edo period and it's a time of peace. And that's when sake brewers could really concentrate on commercializing or industrializing, probably would be a better way to put it, the, the, the sake industry. And it really flourishes. But this this thing about Kimoto to to Yamahai to Sokujo and and the progression, it's a it's a much deeper conversation than talking about kimoto in the sense of what people probably have in their mind kimoto to mean. Most likely, a lot of beginners have in their an image in their head that kimoto is synonymous with winter brewing, uh, kanzukuri, and winter brewing is synonymous with the Edo period. But in actual fact, you know the the process of pole pole ramming or pureeing the mash, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to refer to it as mototsuri from now on. That process is actually really late on in the Edo period. This is what the, the point that I've tried to get across in our podcast several times is the process of kimoto by mototsuri was really the tip of the iceberg. It was the most modern way of doing it. And this doesn't come in until tamba brewers start turning up in places like Itami and Nada. This is the beginning of the 19th century. So the Edo period, you know, the Meiji Restoration started in 1868 and Mototsuri became a thing, you know, the early years of the, you know, the 19th century. So that entire period, what, 200 odd years during the Edo period, they did not make sake in that way. It was made in a, a number of different ways and, if you st- we can't obviously go into each one now, but if you study them <laughs> in any great detail, it's it's phenomenal how quickly they were developing and how you know considering you don't make great strides typically in brewing in in any segment, it comes very gradually. But during that Edo period, you see this fantastic transformation away from ba- Bodai Moto into what they now collectively call Kimoto K. So these are all the different variations that were not mototsuri. And then it kind of peaks at the end of the Edo period and we have kimoto. So one of the things that you said in your in your notes was how did it take brewers so long to get from, you know, pole ramming or yamaroshi to yamahai? The, the answer is it didn't really. It, it's only a period of about 100 years, which in a very monolithic industry like the sake industry, that's not that, you know, great a period, or certainly not in my opinion. So it, it didn't really take them that long. Between Yamahai and Sokojo, that was very quick. That was, you know, Yamahai was, a, you know, developed, and then I think the next year they came up with Sokojo. I think, I think we can, I think we can safely say that uh, Yamahai and Sokojo are are essentially the same time. Right, they they were sort of documented. They were discussed publicly a year apart, but obviously, you know, the development process and all of that uh, background was going on prior to that. And I think one of the things that really happens at that point, sort of when we when we talk about you know the transfer from Kimoto to Yamaha to Sokujo, is is it wasn't a transfer from Kimoto to Yamaha to Sokujo. It was they were brewing sake 
in all of these different ways that we call Kimoto, Yamahai was documented uh, around 1909, I think it was. And then Sokujo was documented. And suddenly Sokujo just sort of took over. And like Andy said, it was all about stability. It was all about research. But we're, when we're looking at that, we're looking at the growth, the sort of the appearance of a scientific body of literature about sake at that period, right? The early uh, 20th century, 1900s, right? This is when the scientific method was really uh, taking root in Japan and, and they were applying it to sake brewing. And talking about it, right? They, they have a, a journal of sake brewing. And that's where they were talking about these things. And that's why it looks sudden. It looks like, oh, we were, we were doing this, this one way for you know, 300 years. And now suddenly we're doing it in, in two different ways. And that's just what the, the documentation is saying. Yeah, it definitely is like uh, it's, it's a big change, like um you know, in, in, as we were talking about English language, um, sake knowledge, it's usually the idea is Kimoto was uh, Yamaroshi for 300 years and then suddenly they decide, oh yeah, we don't need it. But in reality, it's completely different stories, <laughs> uh, which is fascinating. It is, it is, yeah, a completely different story. Like, yeah, go ahead, Annie. Yeah, I the whole moto tsuri thing it it kind of i'm kind of conflict a bit conflicted about the whole thing because i was actually speaking to um another uh, toji about this at, at the weekend there, there's we, we need to be kind of careful i guess the the argument that i heard about only referring to kimoto is kimoto that's made by moto tsuri was one that's really only done for the benefit of consumers because if, if you actually, if you then say actually, you know, something that we see in the podcast all the time, but if you say Kimoto is not just Mototsuri, there's all these different variations that make up the Kimoto K family. You know, you have uh, Nimoto, which means boiled moto. You have Bodai moto, um, which is not part of the Kimoto K family. You have, but, it, but it's sometimes banded in. You have Mizumoto, which was one of the early um, variations of, of Kimoto. You have Girimoto. These are all kind of, and all interestingly, flirting around the idea of Mototsuri Kimoto and, and also Yamaha. There's elements of Yamaha in some of these older styles as well. But if you're a consumer and you're trying to explain what Kimoto is, and then you, you open that, you know, Pandora's box, you know, you can imagine it's going to kind of lose a lot of people straight away. So the argument that I was hearing was that it's fine to just say that Kimoto is Mototsuri for, for the benefit of making it easier to understand, but the the, the broader definition, Kimoto K, shouldn't just be ignored as well. And that's kind of, you know, we're we're not catering for that when we talk about Kimoto and we make a podcast about Kimoto. We want to tell the the whole story but we, we should also be mindful of the fact that it's you know customer facing it's you know you could spend years just looking into the variations just during the Edo period and uh, yeah that's maybe not what you know newcomers should be getting told about when uh, when we talk about Kimoto yeah. okay before we continue let me remind you about London Sakya, our sponsor, and their huge selection of curated Sakya sets, which provide a great opportunity to explore various styles and types of Sakya. Have a look, but don't forget about the magic word SUGIDAMA, all caps, to get your 10% discount. I think Sakya is this topic when it's all this conflict between mm, trying to explain things and keep it simple. Because even this um, system, when you've got uh, Junmai, Junmai, Daiginjo, Ginjo, it's very complex for a lot of people. And uh, it's always like people saying, oh yeah, we probably should go away from these definitions and come up with something easier. Like um, probably in wine, it's uh, just... Um, name of the grape and uh, probably name of the area where uh, it was produced rather than 
going into some kind of technical um, technicalities of uh, wine production or types of grapes or whatever. And the same with production, because obviously sake is a process-driven uh, drink. So that's why it's, you've got so many variation in, in production of sake. And um, it's uh, obviously quite difficult sometimes to convey this depth of um, production processes and uh, methods and techniques to consumer who probably don't care about the technicalities. They just want to understand, okay, if I see that, what can I expect? <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's such a, that's such a tricky problem because how do you convey what to expect on the label? Uh, because all of those things are going to influence what happens, but more than more than anything, it's just the, the what did the the toji, what did the brewer decide to do? Like you know, that's that's it. When they made this sake, they decided so many things, and all of those things are are expressed in the final product in a in unique ways it's always going to be something so different and yeah how do you express that in an appealing way to a consumer i don't know the answer alex do you know the answer no i don't think anyone <laughs> knows <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll come up with an answer at some point i don't know <laughs> it's uh, definitely it's a lot of discussion about that and uh, i think things like taco bed so it's usually as I understand, very often used just to make sure that people don't have like a wrong impression of from the label uh, what it is or something like that. Or um, even like a, I was judging uh, at IWC uh, in, in April uh, and we sometimes we had sake which was labeled at like say Junmai Daiginjo, but it wasn't Junmai Daiginjo by the characteristics you you try it and you say it's probably something different and you don't know how to judge it because obviously you want to judge it as Junbai Daiginjo if it's Junbai Daiginjo the brewery failed because it's not by by the you know what you would expect but on the other hand it's um it's probably some kind of modern trends in making slightly different things which probably lead us to the next question about current sake trends and i think it's, it's quite interesting that you said that kimota in reality was a the whole combination of different methods and techniques which were branded as kimota in the hindsight that's saying okay we're looking back and it's all kimota and um, because it was long time ago and probably not very well documented we just accept it's uh, the, the the same method does it happen now do we have now different sort of types of techniques methods which people don't really know about or don't really realize that and um, how it drives the trends in 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 sake i mean to to, to continue on kimoto i mean i think you know, probably six six times out of ten, when you drink something that has Kimoto on the label, it, it's probably not what you know the the customer has in their mind. I think you know, ten out of ten consumers in that scenario are going to have the Mototsuri image in their head. But nowadays, you know, particularly you're talking about modern trends. The modern trends at the moment are to to really, you know, integrate traditional methods with modern techniques and that leads for almost countless variations of let's just say Kimoto and Yamahai or Kimoto K the, the lines are so blurred between those two products now you know you have you know the Noto Guild that say they're making Yamahai and they're using a effectively a drill to you know to, to puree the mash which is in essence, mototsuri, isn't it? it it's it's I mean, kind of it's, <laughs> it's done yeah. for the same reason. And then you have other people that you know, like like 
some of the sake that I made this this season, which was was Kimoto, by by all intents and purposes. But we didn't. I mean, it certainly wasn't Yamaha, but we didn't carry out Moto Tsuri. I mean, you know, we put hybrid Kimoto on our label because we just didn't think it was right to just put simply Kimoto. But but there are there are many brands out there. They're not not saying anything negative about the breweries. I don't think they have really a choice. But you maybe have Kimoto on the label, and actually, what you're drinking is probably Yamaha or closer to Yamaha than Kimoto. So, you know that that is one modern trend which is really interesting for brewers and really interesting for you know really pushing the boundaries. As I say, taking the good elements of traditional techniques and then integrating them with 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 modern techniques. Some go even further, and they just you know they try and replicate you know, what they call Kodaishu, you know, these really traditional techniques. But that that would be one modern trend. The the, the only problem with that is it's very difficult, I, I imagine, for, um, you know, the people that are promoting, the people that are on the front line to, A, keep up with it, and, and B, even if they understand it, to be able to explain it uh, briefly, you know, succinctly to, to, say, a customer on a restaurant floor. Why do you think that a brewer is trying to use the traditional methods now? Why are they looking back and trying to replicate or introduce some of the very traditional techniques into their brewing process while they can probably look forward and try to come up with some kind of new things? Why why this, this trend of looking back and trying to to introduce more traditional uh, elements into sake brewing? Honestly, because they, they work. Mm. You know, ki- Kimoto, Kimoto is, a, is a fantastic method of making sake. When you, when you speak to a lot of brewers that, that you know, focus on Kimoto, they'll tell you that, that the colony of yeast that you develop with a Kimoto-style, you know, shubo or, uh, or yeast starter... They're, it's extremely strong. It's a very strong, and it will give you a, a strong fermentation going into the to the main mash. They're they're tried and tested methods. I know we mentioned obviously that the spoilage rate was was very high, but by the time you get to you know Kimoto and you know Yamaha, they've kind of got past all that. You you know now coupled with what we know about the importance of hygienic environment in the brewery. Now that you have stronger yeasts, you know, these uh, cultured yeasts at their disposal rather than very unstable yeasts that they would use that were that were just ambient or wild even. You couple all that together and you've got these fantastic ways of making sake. Kimoto is, it, it, it's my favorite style of sake. I know Jim has, uh, has a fondness of Kimoto as well. It just offers... To, to a lot of drinkers that are looking for you know versatility and a bit more robustness, you know that that particular type of sake maybe slightly higher acidity, Kimoto is just a brilliant way to do it. So for for me, it's only natural now that you know they can look back with you know with the, the benefit of hindsight and and really show appreciation for these fantastic methods that were um, that were created um, back in the Edo period. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've talked to some brewers that are, are really emphatic about their use of traditional methods, um, going beyond just Kimoto or Yamaha, like also using wooden tanks and things. And part of it is... I, it's 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 a com- it's complex for everybody. It, there's no one simple reason, but uh, you know, like Andy said, they do create a, a very stable, strong, effective fermentation. They also result in sake that is really, really commercially successful. Like it, it's sake that appeals to people, and it is sake that is shelf stable which is something that is becoming increasingly important in the market for all kinds of reasons, right? Like it's, uh, I was talking to someone who 
um, who says that basically in their, their opinion, the future of sake is all about sake that ages well. And not just because of, you know, the, the sophistication or the, the connection to the wine world, but because it's going to be exported, right? It's going to be on ships for weeks that may get quite hot. It's going to be on the shelves of sh shops all over the world where no one knows, you know, is it going to be air conditioned? Are they going to be in refrigerators? Are they going to be sold within a year? Nobody knows. So you have to have sake that's, that's ready for that environment. And that's what Kimoto and Yamaha really, really are good at. Like they really robust firm sake. And I think there, there's an appeal there. And then there's also just the idea of some kind of differentiation of, of putting something on the label that stands out to people that they can look at and, and say, hey, there's something going on here that may be interesting. Right. So it, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So so apart from looking back, what other trends you can pick up being in Japan, going to sake shops, talking to the uh, breweries and making sake, obviously. So what is the other things that definitely you can see trending uh, in terms of, I don't know, either process driven or taste driven or whatever driven? Andy, you want to start? Yeah, I, th I think you need to make a distinction for, first and foremost when you talk about trends between what brewers are doing and what consumers are doing because they, they are quite quite different. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously we mentioned Kodaishu, you know, look, making more traditional sake. That that that's that's an obvious one that I think actually applies to to both consumers and uh, and brewers. Unfortunately, we are going to have to go back again because one of the other ones that I picked up on is, you know, lower polishing um, percentages. You know, that that to, to me, from, from what I can see in, in my own little, you know, sake bubble is you're, you're seeing much more lower polishing percent. You know, 80% has become quite normal, I think, in the Junmai category. There's people going to, to the other end of the extremes. And, and I think it probably is a backlash of overly polished rice mm. that were that were kind of flooding the market and very expensive. And I, I make no bones about it. I, I always felt were very gimmicky. I never really saw the the appeal after drinking some of them as well. I couldn't understand what the the appeal was, and it, it felt like they were just you know, doing something to, to grab attention, you know, when you start to get to, you know, zero and mm. 1% and these kind of things. I think there was a, a kind of a backlash against that. So I, I, I welcome that. I, I welcome, you know, these lower, you know, these hi highly polished sake as well. I think they have a time and a place, um, but it's good to see it going going the other way. And the, one of the, the very stubborn myths in the industry that, rice that hasn't been polished heavily you know 70 percent or sometimes even 70 percent is you know is poor quality sake it, it is not the case so yeah that that would be the only one i could i, I could think of as a as a trend that we're seeing in japan at the moment mm -hmm. i think a one that i've been noticing a little bit more is is a trend towards lower alcohol content like there's a there, people have been you know talking a lot there's a lot more genshu out there and and the idea of genshu is that it's going to be a higher alcohol content but it's it's not the case anymore like you're it's not at all uncommon to see genshus in the 15 to 16 percent and you know there are a lot there are different ways to achieve that whether it's by adding a bit of water before pressing or sort of holding back the fermentation or pressing earlier and things but I definitely see a an increase in sake that is less than fifteen percent. Um, you know, it, it's hard to say like what the standard uh, ABV for a, a sake is, but um, I've definitely seen more in the twelve percent range. There's one from one of my favorite breweries out there right now that it's at six. Oh, really? And. Uh, I'm not sure I want to drink it or not, but it's, it's out there. <laughs> so. Like um, a strong and, beer. Yeah. 
I think, and, and it's definitely something that is a conscientious decision on the part of brewers to broaden appeal. They feel, I think there's a, there are a lot of brewers who feel that the industry needs to start bringing in new drinkers um, who maybe did not look at sake as an option because the image is of, you know, it's, it's a higher alcohol content. It's stronger. It's got sort of that. I, I don't want to, I don't want to generalize, but that old man appeal, and I'm speaking here as an old man who likes sake, <laughs> but uh, they, they, there has been that discussion. Like, you know, I I've had that discussion with brewer owners and brewer workers who have said, you know, you know, we have to be able to offer that. We have to be able to offer that option to people who maybe are not looking for something so strong. And it, it is out there. I think it, it goes in hand in hand with the sparkling sake as well. So, Yeah, I've also noticed that Gensho is definitely, while you can see more Gensho, it's definitely going down in terms of ABV. Because before, you, you, you've got... To, quite a lot of like 17, 18% Genshu ABV. But now it's more like a normal sake, probably 1% higher, sometimes even lower. Like, um, I don't remember, it's uh, some of the sake here, which is Genshu, but I think it's 12%. It's definitely, um, there is a trend in lowering down Genshu, but um, probably producing more variety of uh, of this style. Quite often during what when I was judging, quite often it came up several times from different uh, fellow judges who know much more about sake than uh, I do uh, about this um, modern juicy style of sake. Let's say. They think, oh yeah, this is a modern juicy style. This is a modern juicy style. Oh yeah, it's again this modern juicy style. Do you have any insight into that? I, I'm I'm drinking one right now <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that, that that Jim will be very familiar with because it was Jim that uh, gave me the bottle. But oh. uh, the I'm drinking Kanki uh, from Sumi Kawasaki Brewery, uh, which is a, which is a Jimmai Daiginjo and. It, it is it's fantastic, but it, it's semi buy forty percent, so it's a it's a proper proper daiginjo, and I would describe that as as very juicy. Uh, it's very it's very rich. Um, it, it has a real sweetness. So yeah, I I would consider that as I don't know if I'd consider that a modern juicy style. I mean that that kind of Saki started with Ju and um, that that's the one that propelled that kind of sake to fame and led to to many people trying to replicate it, and po- possibly the the, the the Toji maybe study at Ju Yondai is that yeah. is that right, yeah. Jim? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so there you go. He, yeah, he did study at Ju Yondai, so 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 yeah. I, I'm I'm drinking. I would I would tend to when I'm talking to people in the industry, I tend to say it's it's kind of Ju Yondai key. Uh, rather than you know juicy and you know fruity or whatever, it's 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 very juyondai, uh, and I, hmm. so yeah, I, I'm not sure how modern it is though. It's been that that's been kind of uh, <laughs> a, a, a firmly fixed style for quite quite a while now. Hmm. So just just so our listeners out there, he is drinking uh, Kanki from Sumikawa, which which is uh, the brewery that makes uh, Toyobi Jean. Would be the I think more more commonly known label. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I would say that Fukucho is probably in that category as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, I, com- compared to what I'm drinking now, Fukucho is much drier. There's um I, I guess it's it's lighter than than mm-hmm. what I'm drinking right now. But but yeah, there's similarities and you know. When I drink Fukujo, I, I tend to drink the the, the ginjo because we make a lot more ginjo than dai ginjo. So there there is that element that we're not really comparing apples with apples. This is a you know a forty percent uh, jumai dai ginjo made with Yamada Nishiki, and 
we typically make um, Jumai Ginjo with Hatan So, which is quite possibly the, the polar opposite of Yamada Nishiki in terms of the flavor profile. So, but yeah, it, it is a it is a, a modern Ginjo style of sake that we make. So, I think one of the things that that comes up, especially when we with that word juicy, um, is this sort of really bright. Uh, sort of z- zippy acidity rather than a really heavy, rich acidity. Uh, that's that's kind of what I would associate with that term. But obviously, you know, everyone's got their own internal language when it comes to flavor, and and it's it's hard to to hit sort of mm, commonalities, yeah. particularly with something as uh, undefined as undefined as ju- as as juicy may be. So. Mm. Another thing that I, I noticed here, and I was wondering if it's just um, more like an um, export thing or something is going in Japan as well, it's uh, the, you can see more namazake definitely in the market. And I sort of associate it with the fact that the retailers, uh, restaurants, they become more knowledgeable in how to keep sake, how to um, handle it, and um, so now a lot of places that sell sake, um, like um, stores, like Japanese stores and or wine stores, um, they keep it in, in the fridge, they tender for them properly, uh, and uh, it makes it possible to probably import more namazake than it used to be a few years ago when you couldn't find Nama at all in, in London or only like um, uh, one or two labels. What do you think about it? Is it a trend in Japan or is it more like um, this export trend? I think it's probably a trend in, in export. And, and I think it just comes from uh, most, most likely uh, the brewers having more confidence in, in the people that are handling, like, like you said, the people that are handling the sake from from the way I see it, I, I'm sure there's some bad ones out there. I couldn't genuinely couldn't think of any off the top of my head. But the the people that are, you know, bringing sake into um to these foreign markets, um, are, are generally very very good at what they do. They're you know they are they are doing a good job. And you know the the people that I speak to on a on a business level, you know we we trust them. Um, we, we we absolutely trust them to, to to do the right thing with with our sake, and I, I do think that speaks volumes for the for the, for the level of you know these uh, these businesses that are doing exporting. So so that would be one thing. In in Japan, I think it's you know there's there's nama everywhere. It, I don't think it's kind of really a new thing. Um, maybe Jim will disagree. I, I don't know. No, not at all. Like I, I, Nama has always just been there. Uh, particularly, you know, it, it's it's kind of, it's relatively seasonal, but not. Um, I I haven't noticed any changes in the amount. So yeah, I I definitely think it's something changing in the export market. And yeah, the, the it's just I think there's an improved cold uh, logistics flow uh, in most of the export markets these days. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, any other trends you would like to uh, pick up? Mm. I don't know if it, it counts as a trend, but something that I have definitely been seeing is is more new breweries lately, and not maybe not necessarily like completely new, like out of nowhere, but. Uh, just the idea that, that suddenly there are breweries that can open breweries that were not brewing before can now start again, or the, there are people who are buying the licenses and getting things going again, uh, which is just so nice. Like obviously yeah. the industry is still not as healthy as it should be. And it obviously, you know, Corona has, has changed a lot of things, but uh, I I've definitely seen, in the past 
say four, three or four years, a lot of talk about, you know, Japan's newest brewery is open. Japan's newest brewery. I've seen that like four times mm. <laughs> in, in, in sort of recent memory. So I, I, I hope that becomes a trend, but no. it's certainly not, uh, it, it's certainly not as, as dreary as it once was when everyone was closing. What do you think about the future? Do you see any direction that sake brewing will go in terms of, I don't know, um, style, taste, uh, process, anything? If you will have like um, to speculate about so what we can see in the future, what, what do you think? Um, I, I'm quite optimistic about this for, for on a personal level. Uh, this is maybe slightly controversial, but I, I think that there, there's going to be a, a, a shift away from this obsession with daiginjo, this obsession with highly aromatic sake that, that tends to be fragile, which was also probably brewed with one mind on trying to make it closer to white wine. And I, I genuinely believe that as consumer awareness increases and as more and more companies start to look overseas and to export their sake and with just more sources of information available to, to people that are interested in sake, I think the door is going to open for a much wider range of sake to, to, to hit these overseas markets and I think it will be well received. P personally speaking, this is purely subjective, but I tend not to drink a lot of these, what, what people say quote unquote premium sake are. I tend to be more at the, the Honjozo, Jumai, you know, maybe the kind of more full bodied Ginjos, typically Kimoto, um, you know, often, often Yamaha as well. I think these styles of sake are, are going to become much more popular. And as a natural progression to that, I think you might see a bit of a, a shift away from these incessant com comparisons with wine because it's such a strange strategy to, to try and, you know, piggyback on the, on something like wine when you have, a product like Nihonshu, it is superior to, to wine in so many different ways. And there are things that wine does better than sake, but sake has its own unique set of characteristics. Um, you know, versatility, its ability to be, you can, you can play with the temperature like almost no other beverage, alcoholic beverage on the market. It's extraordinary ability to, to pair with food. And the, 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 I think in recent years, it, it has kind of, they, they've, they've, a lot of brewers have been ignoring all these good elements and then trying to make sake that tastes like white wine. So my, my own opinion, uh, maybe I am being optimistic, I think people will move away from that when they realize the, the true potential for, for sake and particularly pairing with Western cuisine. So that, that is what I hope and what I genuinely think will uh, will happen in the in the future. Maybe not the near future, but um, certainly the 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 future at some point. Uh, my opinion, like I I don't disagree with Andy, and I I think that um, there is going to be uh, I think as as people in the sake industry in Japan grow more confident with their place in the world market, uh, I think there will be a, a trend away from sort of the wine ness of a lot of the the approaches i think that's that's going to be a change but i also think that there's going to be both in japan and outside of japan a lot more attention and a lot more understanding of of aged sake of koshu uh i think that it's inevitable that uh, people are going to start um treating it like an actual segment of the market rather than, you know, a forgotten corner of the market. And I think that that's a good thing. I, 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 
I personally believe in. And, and I'm talking here not about like, you know, the th- 20 or 30 year old stuff, although that, that will be there, but just, you know, accepting that sake that is three or four years old is probably going to be uh, a superior product to um, your expectations. I, I think that people are going to start realizing that, that letting sake sit for a, a couple of years is almost always going to improve it. Um, so I, I think that that awareness is going to become more common and accepted and that people are going to uh, like sake more because of it. But hey, you know, what do I know? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think in a way, I absolutely agree that um, I personally was moving from Ginger style sake, you know, like gravitating towards uh, um, Honjo's and Junma in my, in my taste. I usually now pick up Junmai sake or Honjo's sake um, rather than going for Junmai da Ginger. And uh, I can see definitely there is a trend um, speaking to other people. And I agree that Koshu is definitely, it's, it's a big thing and um, it's, uh, it's amazing drink and uh, I'm like looking forward for people to, to realize it and start buying it more and enjoy it. Yeah, um, at the end of the episode, um, I usually ask my guests to feature some sake. Uh, so would you like to, to do that? Probably something that you think in a way represents some kind of trends or represents the sake brewing state of sake brewing now i don't know do you want to go first jim or sure i am going to just sort of touch on a whole bunch of things that we talked about uh and i'm going to recommend kanenaka the label kanenaka it should be fairly widely available in in sort of those major markets uh they do have exporters into the UK into Europe and into the United States, but not like a lot. Um, Kanenaka is all uh, Kimoto and it is uh, Motosuri Kimoto. They, they do the, the whole thing. They, they've got people with poles standing around Hangiri and they don't sing, but, um, and they also uh, age a lot of their sake as well. Uh, it comes in three varieties. There is a black labeled Cho Karakuchi, and then there is a Yamada Nishiki, and then there is a uh, Nihonbare, I think is the, th- the third one. But it's all made with locally grown rice, so it's it's very, very local. And uh, it's it's outstanding. Andy, I, I sent you some. I, you, you, I don't know if you liked it or not, but um, it's it's definitely becoming my go-to recommendation when people are asking me, you know, you know what's going on in Yamaguchi that we don't know about? Kanenaka is what's going on in Yamaguchi that you don't know about, and you should. Well, Jim, I haven't tried the one you sent me because I'm I'm saving it for for a time that you know I, I have the, the the time at hand to to try it at, at numerous different temperatures, and I've not had the time oh, recently. Yeah. You, but I did you, try you. the the Karakuchi one uh, recently when I was drinking in in Saijo with, uh, with with a friend of mine, and he's quite well known in the industry he has very strong opinions about uh he's very difficult to please and he picked that one out and the owner said great choice and i said oh that's one that my friend of mine has just sent me so yeah you're, you're definitely touching on some there seems to be a real buzz around that sake right now i'm, I'm seeing it in in numerous different places where, where i hadn't seen it before so whatever they're doing at that brewery um, you, I know you know them well, Jim. Uh, tell them to to keep at it because it's uh, yeah, it was the Karakuchi one was fantastic as well. So I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you. I let them know. Mine is a bit more straightforward, but I think it's a very uh, appropriate one to what we've been talking about, uh, and it is available in the UK. So I am going to recommend Masume Okuden uh, Kanzukuri, which is a um, very well known brand. Masume, they're famous for being the place where uh, yeast number seven or Kyokai uh, Nanago was isolated and it is brewed with uh, Nanago. The best way I would describe this, it's just a good everyday Junmai. It does what I think Junmai should 
should do, which it kind of just chameleons into the to the dinner table. It it doesn't necessarily jump out the glass at you or or the cup if you prefer, but it's a brilliant pairing for food. It's good just to drink on its own as a as a kind of session sake. You know the the aromatics aren't particularly high. It's you know made with number seven, but it does have a nice. Um, fragrance to it as well so if someone is maybe up until this point and don't get me wrong I love Ginjo as well but if someone wants a good alternative to um, to, to the vast amount of Ginjo shoe that's probably available uh, or, or doing the rounds overseas then that would be my uh, recommendation of what of what Jumai is all about yeah I think it's a great recommendation both of them definitely it's um, for those who want to explore more about sake and modern styles and um, just to to see how it goes yeah i think it's a, it's a great point to continue their journeys <laughs> okay thanks a lot for uh coming to the podcast i think we've got a fantastic talk uh, i think we've got a bit of geekiness a bit of nerdness <laughs> and a, a bit of um very good insight into what is going on in in japan in terms of sake so i think we've got very good conversation thanks a lot thank you alex it was a pleasure thank you alex yeah thanks for, thanks for having us on yeah thanks a lot. that's it for today this episode was the conclusion of the emergence of sake series where we're we're looking at sake brewing and the sake industry in general from ancient times till nowadays. I hope that you have enjoyed the series. I'll be back with the final episode of this season and then we'll break for a couple of months before starting season 4. In the meantime, buy the sake recommended by Jim and Andy. I found Kanenaka Kimoto Junmai at the Sake Shoten online sake shop. I think it's a new entry in the UK sake online retailers. I will put the link in the show notes. And Masumi Okuden Kantsukuri Junmai is available from the London Sake website where you can get a 10% discount by entering Sugidama all in caps at the checkout as well from various other sake and wine shops. If you have any questions or suggestions about any second topic, just drop me a line. My email address is alex at sugidama.co.uk or you can tag me on Instagram or Twitter at Sugidama blog in one word. Again, if you like the episode and want more, hit the subscribe button and you will get every new episode downloaded to your player as soon as it's out. Leave a review if you have time. It's easy and doesn't require you to write war and peace. Just a few sentences. You can do it either on Apple Podcasts or on the Podchaser website. The link to my page there is in the show notes. If you use Spotify, please rate Sugidama Podcast there. Share this podcast with your friends on your social media and chat apps. Many people mention a friend's recommendation as a reason for listening to a particular podcast. So you can be that friend and introduce your friends to the amazing world of sake and support Sugidama podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. Come by. Sugi, 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 sugi dama blog. Sugi, 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 sugi dama blog.